Hi there. The book Nazis, Spies and Fakes by Guy Walters. Ten years at the coalface of history. Guy Walters uh, had written quite a few uh, fictional books uh, based around either wartime or espionage things. But he also has written extensively on the actual history of uh, World War II and uh, of uh, modern espionage. And uh, he has published a collection of his articles, mainly from the Daily Mail, uh, on this subject. And uh, it, they're very readable, um, and uh, he, d he has unearthed quite a bit of um, previously um, little-known information. So the book opens with his premise that um, the, there is a lot of uh, fetishizing of the Nazis, where the iconography and uh, the um, the whole ethos of the uh, Nazi um, philosophy uh, in the in the West, uh, and more specifically in uh, Britain today. And he, he kind of paints a picture of um, a schoolboy, uh, in, in the, this case at a uh, public school, who is reading the war comics, the commando comics, uh, and, and uh, the victor and so on. Uh, he's uh, watching war movies of the time, and he's making uh, airfix models of uh, Luftwaffe aircraft and uh, Nazi vehicles. And uh, th this then turns him into um, a, a Nazi fetishist. And although very, very wittily written, I think it, it's very much a broad generalization because he, that's virtually a generation of schoolboys of my era. That's, that's what we did. Um, and it didn't turn us into um, apologists or fetishists or appreciators of um, the, the, the uh, Nazis in any way. Um, in my particular case, uh, I made lots of airfix models of aircraft and they were always of the aircraft I particularly liked, the, the type. Um, and only one aircraft I can ever remember making was uh, German. It was a Henschel, and uh, I did make a Tiger tank because uh, I'd read a book on tanks, and I, w I was going to make um, the major tanks, uh, German, uh, British, and American. And I started with the Tiger, and it was such a difficult job with the tracks and the track wheels that that's the only one I ever made. Uh, but it didn't. It didn't. Um, uh, make me want to um, really uh, become a Nazi in any way, making airfix kits. However, what does resonate um, is uh, uh, true. Uh, I, I listened to a podcast recently by uh, Al Murray and James Holland, and they mentioned, they go to a lot of these um, mili military and military vehicle rallies. And um, I've never been to one. I've been to military shows uh, where, where there's all sorts of different military. Particularly, you know, I was interested in, in things like the SOE um, equipment. Um, but the, these military vehicle rallies, and um, there's a lot of reenactment people. Now, I, I never really um, mock people's hobbies because I think having a hobby is great. I think people should have interests. Um, but I, I did once see a, at, a, at an airfield, um, saw a group of guys dressed as um, American wartime um, airborne troops. Uh, and, and they were kitted out um, with the um, weapons. Obviously, they were non functional and the, the uniforms, insignia, and so on. Uh, quite a few of them would have been quite a, a, a weight hazard to fit in into a Dakota of the time, I think. Um, and I did, I must admit, I did find it faintly ridiculous. Um, however, what Al Murray and James Holland talks about is that these um, 
um, vehicle rallies, you do get a lot of reenactors dressed as Waffen SS. And they found that very disturbing. And I hadn't really thought about it until they mentioned it. And then, um, because I hadn't seen it myself, and, and I must admit, it is very disturbing. Um, just to paint a picture, the, the SS uh, in, in general was the um, security staff of the Nazi state, Nazi party. And um, obviously they were responsible for the concentration camps and um, the Holocaust. Uh, and also the massacres on the Eastern Front, the Einsatzgruppen, fell under the SS. And But then they had an armed section which was parallel to the German army, which was called the Waffen SS. And um, the kind of excuse for that, um, Soldaten wie andere auch, they were soldiers like any other. Um, in as much as they had Panzer divisions, Panzer Grenadier divisions, infantry divisions, and so on, just like the rest of the German army, um, they were responsible for war crimes. Even the most, um, uh, the, the, I was going to say elite, but by their terms, elite of the units, the Panzer divisions. Um, Early on in the uh, uh, war in 1940 in France, for example, um, they killed, uh, captured British prisoners. And um, the war, that was brought up in the war crimes trials after the war. Of course, um, just after D-Day, Das Reich Division um, was trying to get to the beaches to reinforce and uh, were delayed by resistance activity and uh, carried out massacres, including um, the village of Orador, which is kept as a memorial. And that's just two examples. That was in the West and what they got up to in the East, um, God only knows. So they were responsible for a lot of atrocities. Having said that, um, the Wehrmacht, the German army, uh, was was also implicated in a lot of nastiness, particularly in the East, uh, particularly with the um, the massacres uh, of, of um, partisans and uh, the Jewish populations out there. Um, but there's no doubt that the Waffen SS was um, an, a nasty organisation. So why anybody would want to uh, dress up in their uniform? And, and strut about is is, some, is very disturbing. And I remember um, a, a chap who was um, uh, an extra, or he had small part in films, was mentioned he was playing um, an SS uh, soldier in a movie, him, him and some other guys. And he said, he said, we did tend to swag around. He said, offset, he said, in the canteen and so on. He said, it, it, it kind of, it comes with the uniform, he said, and, and, and people look at, look at that uniform in fear, and rightly so. So um, I think Guy Walters uh, does have a, a point there, and um, possibly some of it could be excused by the younger generation not fully realising the implication um, for things like a fancy dress party, you know, you know but... Uh, that's not really what this this is. This is people who are reenacting uh, being a, uh, a German soldier, uh, and in this case, a Waffen SS soldier. Um, I, I know some of the young young people I've spoken to. I, I, I've mentioned just as a test what what, what does Belson mean to? Me? They've got no clue at all. So um, that's the opening, and then he goes on. To, there's a, a chapter on the. Um, the British section of the Waffen SS, because the Waffen SS had um, many nationalities in it um, and, and fielded quite large uh, units up to divisional size of, of foreign nationalities. And they tried to have a British section, the British of Freiko, uh, originally called the Legion of St. George, which were recruited from uh, prisoner of war camps. Uh, it was all um, the idea of John Amory, who was the son of um, a cabinet minister who was a traitor. 
and um, a chap called Thomas Cooper was prominent in it and he was actually uh, his mother was German and he was fighting uh, he was a member of the Waffen SS he'd uh, gone to he was in Germany at the start of the war and he'd um, joined up and uh, he uh, was um, the main uh, uh, recruiter uh, around the camps and they they, they did get probably 50 or so people, uh, people who were either fascists before the war in the British Union of Fascists or uh, were easily led uh, or were swayed by the promise of better rations and um, uh, a, a, a good time on leave and so on uh, to get out of the prisoner of war camps. Uh, but they never, Hitler had uh, insisted that the unit could only um, be deployed if they had a minimum of 30 and they never had 30 guys at one time so it wasn't massive but the disturbing thing is uh, after the war the files on it were um, uh, restricted for 75 years by the British government so it was obviously an embarrassment uh, of, sort of some note and um, the uh, it was a bit of a when um, we point the fingers at the other nationalities who uh, were in the Waffen SS, uh, at least you know a handful of uh, Brits were involved as well. Um, another chapter is about the bomb plot, uh, the 20th of July 44 bomb plot, uh, uh, Valkyrie, uh, uh, Stauffenberg trying to assassinate uh, Hitler in the uh, bunker uh, at the the Wolf's Lair that was called out in uh, East Prussia uh, and it failed it's well known there's a movie starring um, Tom Cruise uh, because the somebody had um, the device was in a briefcase that Stauffenberg had left and uh, somebody pushed it and it was behind the leg of a table and that shielded Hitler from the, the blast and he survived. He was injured a bit but he was more or less unscathed. He was able to make a broadcast straight up there. The reason it failed really wasn't so much the leg of the table or that was a bad stroke of luck. It was the fact that it was originally going to be two devices in the briefcase but Stauffenberg only had time to arm one of them and he didn't put the second device in. Being an officer, he didn't really understand how um, explosive devices work. Had he put the second device in, even though it wasn't um, primed, uh, it would have sympathetically detonated and there would have been an enormous blast, twice the blast and Hitler would have been killed. However, and this is the interesting thing about the chapter, it, he doesn't, um, Guy Walter doesn't go into the reason that the uh, 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 there was only one device. Um, but what he does go into is the fact that uh, Winston Churchill and uh, President Roosevelt didn't want Hitler to be killed. They were not interested in negotiating with German generals. So... Um, Really, who knows what would have happened had Hitler been killed anyway. There's a chapter on the Channel Islands uh, occupied by the Germans. That it opens with a very chilling account of an execution, by a very slow execution, uh, on, at Silt, which was the concentration camp built by the SS on the island. Um, and it's really about collaboration and informing by the population against each other. And again, a very nasty chapter. And again, um, it, it really stops us crowing too much about um, being uh, above such things in the face of things like what, what the French did during occupation and so on. That uh, had we been occupied on the mainland, um, there would have been resistance, but there also would have been collaboration. A chapter on Captain W.E. Johns, the author of the Biggles books, which I read 
the, the series, the whole series, uh, as a boy and thoroughly enjoyed. And he was um, a hero pilot in World War One, and his exploits were quite well known. Um, and and the, the the book debunks them. Um, he he did he was a flyer. He joined the Royal Flying Corps, later the RAF. Um, he destroyed uh, eleven aircraft um, early on, uh, but unfortunately they were all British aircraft. Uh, uh, during his training, he, he um, was absolutely ham-fisted, and um, as, as um, Guy Walters remarks, he would have been an ace in the Luftwaffe of the number of the German uh, uh, British aircraft he destroyed. Uh, he wasn't a captain, he awarded himself the title, and he was a rather a, a fantasist, um, what we generally call a waltz today. Um, although he had flown, and he'd flown in, in wartime conditions, he'd been in, in combat, uh, but he, he just made up a lot of stuff. Um, and uh, it's, it's a pity because I did enjoy those books. So there's other chapters. Um, he busts a lot of myths. Um, he he really gives Simon Wiesenthal um, a really good going over, and rightly so. Um, uh, a lot of the espionage characters and um, the um, the hunt for some of the uh, top Nazis and um, why they they were quite. Um, uh, quite a fallacious activity really good book very enjoyable um, and as I say full of quite surprising information